Wow, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Look at all of you guys. This is awesome. I think that both times that I've been here before, it's been just with the girls. Is that right? Okay, and we have plenty who have been here in the past. Very cool. So guys, hello. It's nice to meet you. My name is Mo. Um, I have, like I said, been here a few times before and I'm excited to be back. Every time uh, we've come here, God has moved in some really, really powerful ways and I truly believe today will be no exception. I was praying for you all very specifically. God gave a very specific word and impartation that I want to release to you. And I want to say from the jump, I know we have all the way a seventh grade our lowest, our youngest, yeah, right over here, all the way to 12th. <laughs> Give it up for the seventh graders. Yes, welcome. <laughs> we love you guys. All the way up to seniors. Are y'all just dispersed all throughout? Seniors right here. Very cool. So I know we have a real swing of ages. I remember high school was like so interesting because you had some kids that truly were so young and some that look like grown fathers. I mean, they were just men in 12th grade. And we were like, oh my God. Um, we have a real swing, right? But here is the beauty of the Word of God and the beauty of the truths of the Word of God is that the Word of God does not return void and there's also no junior Holy Spirit. There's no junior Jesus. There's no junior Abba Father. God is the one who was and is and is to come who knit each of you together in your mother's womb with purpose, with power, with identity on your life, with a destiny on your life. And the word of God does not return void to the young ears or the old. My, I have four kids, five and under. It's a lot. We have a five-year-old, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, a six-month-old. And I'll tell you what I know. People are like, oh God. I know, it's rapid fire, rapid fire in our family. But my five-year-old asks some of the deepest and most profound questions and has a deeper understanding than some 50-year-olds I've met around the gospel and around the spiritual realities of navigating this life. And I love that because it exists because the word of truth has been spoken to her. Conversations are constantly had in our home. And I really believe that what a senior can receive today, a seventh grader can also receive today in every single age in between. Because God has a word that is specific for each and every person. I'm going to keep it simple and very clear. I'll pray before we start. And then we'll move into what God wants to share with you guys. I want to give a disclaimer. Uh, the word of God says that the kingdom of God is not in talk, but in power. And we've lived a lot of life in the church and a lot of times, even in a Christian school where we're hearing a lot, right? There is a lot of talk, a lot of teaching, a lot of explanation. But some of us still feel far from God, still feel dry, still feel not bold, not timid. You know he's doing things in your heart, but like to be around your peers and talk about that, it is uh, very scary or overwhelming. Many of us have heard the word of the Lord, but are still spiritually very timid because we have not yet encountered God in a move of power. And that's what takes things from knowing a lot about God <clears throat> to truly knowing God. That was true of my testimony. I have written several books. If you guys are readers, my first book, Wreck My Life, Journeying from Broken to Bold, is my testimony of moving through being raised up in the church, but then eating disorders and self-harm, uh, then in going off to college, the suicide of my dad my freshman year, anxiety, depression, sexual promiscuity, and then ultimately a car accident that was horrific and left me very physically broken, but was the place where the Spirit of God actually encountered me. And the power of God captivated my heart and began to transform me. So I knew a lot about God most of my life. But it wasn't until I encountered the power of God that my heart 
began to completely transform, that my eyes were open, that my mind was being renewed, and that my life began to change. And so it's important that we humble ourselves, as the Word of God says, and open ourselves up. He says, come to me like little children. Humble ourselves before the Lord and say, God, if you want to encounter me, if you are going to move in power, if there's something that your Holy Spirit is going to bring to my mind or to my heart, I'm humbling myself before you to say that I'm leaning in. You see, deliverance, freedom, salvation, all the wonder works that we see in the Gospels were poured out to people who were hungry. They were coming wanting. Jesus actually avoided whole towns that didn't have the faith to believe that he could do what he could do, that he was Messiah. Our faith becomes so important. Our hunger to lean into God and say, I want you to speak and I want you to move. So if that is your posture today, have expectation that as you're listening, something might manifest in you. You might start feeling some things, some emotions. You might start feeling your heart pounding or your palms sweating or wondering, oh my gosh, what does she know? How does she know that about my story? How would she know this about my life? This is a good thing. If you feel those things, don't run from them or try to stuff them back down. Remember the woman at the well when God drew up all of the deepest things of shame in her life? She didn't run away and deny it. She sat with him at the well and she received living water. And that's what Jesus has for you today. So if you feel things, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Let's pray. We haven't even prayed yet. And we'll jump in. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you. I thank you. I praise you for this time, for this space. I magnify your name. You are Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and the end. The one who was and is and is to come. You are El Shaddai, God Almighty. You are the maker of the heavens and the earth. And as you have formed and created all things, as you are a big and powerful Lord, you also intimately know us. You know every hair on each person's head. You know every piece of their story. You know everything that they are going through at home. You know every thought that they are wrestling with. You know everything that has happened to them. You know what they've been exposed to. You know what they're walking through. You know each and every image-bearing creation here. We thank you for your love and for your tender intimacy God, I pray that your spirit would move into this place and would move in power. I command any unclean spirits, any weapon formed against us to steal, kill, or destroy the efficacy of this message that they would be bound now in the name of Jesus. I pray that the spirit of God would come and would move with a peace that surpasses understanding, that you would set captives free, that you would heal hurting hearts now, today, right where they are. In Jesus' name, we trust you with this time. We give this time to you as an offering before your throne. Lord, let it not return void, but let your word move in power. In Jesus' name, amen. So the word of God says in 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So, what this opens our eyes to is the very reality I was just talking about. Your age is not a qualifier or a disqualifier for the kingdom of God being brought forth through your life and transforming your life. I'm 32 and I, that sounds so weird, that seems old, right? Yet here I am, a 16 year old in my head, but I'm actually 32. <laughs> I was thinking recently about Man, what if a move of God, an encounter with God had occurred when I was in high school? What was I navigating at that time that I didn't now understand until now at 32 that I'm like processing things and working them out and allowing God to heal me and transform me? And the reality is that what I was going through in high school and in middle school was very real and very deep, but I didn't hear anyone talking about it. The books I've written, the first is Wreck My Life, Journeying from Broken to Bold, but the, sec the second is Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot. 
And the third is fully known, an invitation to true intimacy with God. But what our ministry does is I feel an overwhelming urge of the Lord to go to the people of God, the body of Christ, and to speak into the areas that seem taboo or seem like we haven't heard about or seem like we don't talk about. Because what was happening to me in middle school and all the way through high school is that I was navigating and dealing with very real, very hard things, but I would often go to church and hear like, <clears throat> like a cheerleader message, like really soft and fluffy. Or I would hear the gospel, but it was in one ear, out the other, because pieces were missing. And I would be in church. I was a Christian, because my parents were Christians. It was kind of that, like, faith by inheritance thing. In church on Sunday, and, you know, an FCA on Friday, but I knew a lot about God, but I didn't really know God. And I didn't really understand the power of God, because I would be in the church, and then I would go home to tormenting dreams, nightmares, like night terrors, awful things happening to me in my dreams, and awful things that I would choose to engage with in my dreams. I never heard the church talk about it. I was dealing with tension in my home. It felt like I was constantly walking on eggshells around my dad, who I so desperately wanted to make proud, whose love I so desperately desired, but it was like any misstep where I could upset him. I would get the silent treatment for a while, the tight jaw and the silent treatment. And I was in an upper middle class, affluent neighborhood, but I would go home and the relational dynamics in my home were so strange. My father, I came into revelation of at nine years old and it shifted things in me, was struggling with an addiction to pornography. I was exposed. I began struggling with that stuff, very real. Exposed to things very young that overwhelmed me. The church wasn't talking about that. I was dealing with depression at times, perfectionism, performance, anxiety, trying so hard to maintain an image, to be enough, to be what everyone wanted me to be. And really, I didn't know who I was, and I didn't feel many speaking into that. And wanting to learn more about God, wanting to grow in the things of God, but it always felt like there was a block. Like I'd open the Bible and I didn't understand anything I was reading. Or I'd start reading and I'd fall asleep. Or I saw others that were bold and full of this fire and I just thought maybe they were just more enthusiastic. I was very concerned with how others perceived me and so I lived my life walking on this balance beam. Don't mess things up at home. Don't uh, try to fit with the popular group at school. Don't have tension or conflict there. Don't screw up on the soccer field because I was a very competitive athlete. A lot of people expected a lot out of me. Don't screw up there. You have to make the next team. You have to be the first one to do it. You have to get the college scholarship. Don't make a bad grade. Heaven forbid I brought home a bad grade. And it was life on this balance beam. And I would hear that the word of God came and where the spirit of the Lord is, there was freedom. But I lived this very narrow, nervous life. And I was being oppressed and afflicted by things in my dreams as I was awake, thoughts that would come into my mind. Y'all, after my dad committed suicide and I saw his body on a morgue table, when I tell you a spirit of suicide overcame me, I would hear thoughts that I was going to kill myself whether I wanted to or not. That if my father was capable of it, that I would do it too. That it would be by my own hand. I would be tormented by these thoughts. Many of you are tormented in your mind by the enemy. Lying to you. Deceiving you. Setting things before your eyes on social media. Tormented in your mind. And anxious and fearful because of what you're navigating at home, confused about your own identity and worth because no one has ever spoken the truth of your identity and your worth over you. And you live in this state of like, I just knew it is just anxiety. And I was praying 
before I came here, God, what do you have? I don't know many of you. I know I've connected with the girls here, but I was praying, Lord, what does this group need to hear? And what he spoke so clearly was he said, share the full gospel. And he said, because there are four things that are gripping them, four strongholds over this group. Identity, anxiety, fear, and anger. He said, there are four strongholds over this group and all four of those strongholds will fall when they practice forgiveness. So I want to share the full gospel with you because the reason that the gospel was often in one ear and out the other for much of my life was because the church that I was in, the gospel began in the middle of the story. An incomplete gospel. And the middle of that story begins with you are a sinner in need of a savior. Except I was in the South. I was in Georgia. So I was like, honey, you are a sinner in need of a savior. It's like, thank you, Pamela. I know. I feel overwhelmed already. <laughs> and this, this incomplete gospel became very pervasive over time as people were earnest-heartedly trying to seek converts to the faith. But the reality is that that is a shame-starting gospel. It starts at shame. Being a sinner in need of a savior is a very real and very important piece of the gospel. But the gospel story starts with your creation as an image-bearing creation of God. You were made on purpose, with purpose, with power, with identity, with an assignment, with a vision that God the Father had as he knit you together. With an identity as son or daughter of the Most High King. This is how we are formed. This is where things began in the garden, right? Adam and Eve knew perfect oneness with God. There was no sin. There was no separation. God made himself fully. He exhibited himself through man and woman, Adam, mankind, made in his image. And that is your origin story too. Some of you guys have heard that you were an accident. Some of you have heard that you were the oops baby. There's big separation between your age and your siblings. Some of you guys have heard different things growing up that have disqualified and illegitimized. Oh, thought it was the bell. We've got time. That have disqualified and illegitimized who you were first made to be. But what happened in the garden is that deception entered in and the enemy's invitation was, hey, choose for yourself what is best for you. Surely you won't die. His invitation for Eve was, surely what God has for you, what he said about you, what he has established for you isn't enough. You Figure out you. Do what you want to do. And that is the same deception that we encounter every single day. You see, if you think about it in kind of the relational picture, think about this intimacy that we had with God. And then the enemy said, don't you want to be single instead? This invitation to false freedom. And Adam, Eve, took that bait. And while he said, this will be the better way. You can choose what you want. You can live how you want. Your identity is what you want it to be. Your life, your plans, your choices. Worship you. While that looked appealing, it actually brought us out of intimacy with God and trafficked us into a brothel. Do we know what a brothel is? It's where people are made to give their bodies for money. It's where sex is sold and these are victims, oppressed prisoners who people will come through and buy and use. And that is your and my spiritual condition in sin. That any unclean spirit, anything that is not of God has its way with us. Do what you want to do. These are the lies I'll whisper into your mind. This is your identity. Figure out your own identity. Figure out your own plans. We're given to anger. We're given to jealousy. We're envious. We're full of resentment. We're full of hate. And it's because we thought we'd be free in doing things our own way and we ended up imprisoned. But this is the glorious work of the gospel. 
Just as the Bible talks about marriage, you don't have to like close your ears on this part because it's speaking to you. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32 says, Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. So here's what happened. We were trafficked into a brothel of sin. We are sinners. We were sinners, overwhelmed by sin, taken advantage of around every corner. But Christ left his father's house. Man leaves his father's house, came, gave his life, lived a perfect sinless life, gave his life, died and was resurrected to receive his bride, the church, me, you. He came and he carried out the work that was sufficient to get the keys to the kingdom to bust down the prison gates to reach into your darkness and to draw you out into glorious light. Now, how do you think you would be found if you were pulled out of a brothel? I'll actually share with you guys, I heard from a woman uh, who works in the sex trafficking industry in India seeking to set these um, victims free. And they go to these extensive work and planning process to rescue these people. And they bust into these brothels and they have everything on their side. They have the law there. They have the permission. They bust through. They rescue these people out. And when they are found, they are in a sorrowful condition. And when I was found on the side of an interstate by Jesus, when he encountered me truly, I was in a sorrowful condition. I was overwhelmed by sin. I was full of hate. I was full of resentment. I wore the mask and I faked fine because we're all really great at doing that. We should be Academy Award winners for what great actors and actresses we are. I was full of rage and anger and unforgiveness. I was promiscuous. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was enslaved. But when Jesus encountered me in the way he encounters us, in the fullness of the gospel, he brought me out. And the world would say, now clean yourself up, get yourself together, and then I'll come back and then I'll use you. But this is not what Yeshua, our Messiah, what Jesus said. Jesus reaches into the darkness and pulls us out. And just as he finds us, he proposes a covenant of marriage to us. Will you be mine? I'll be yours. Now let's walk together. I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want to free you. I want to touch those wounds and I want to see them made well. See, salvation means healing. It means wholeness. Many of us are like, I prayed this prayer one time and then I think about salvation in the sense of one day when I die. Salvation is your portion each and every day. Walking with him in step with the spirit of God, leading you, healing you, ministering to you, transforming your heart. He heals, he saves, he rescues, he redeems. And then one day as well, we get to spend eternity with him. But the salvation is for now too. And some of us simply need to receive that covenant. I love you. I died for you. But for others of us, this was what was so startling. This woman in India shared that they'll go through all of these efforts to rescue these sex slaves out. They will bring them to a home that has everything they need. Food, care, water, shelter, job provision, safety. And many of those people will still choose to go back to the brothel. It's learned helplessness. Well, there it was safer. Well, there I knew at least I had, you know, a, a roof over my head. Or, or there I feel like my captor, you feel like the enemy maybe did want what was best for me. It's the comfort of what we've known and we don't realize the filth of it. So many of you have encountered Jesus, but as you've walked this thing out, the sin pulls you back in. Well, what would I do if, if I didn't give my boyfriend everything? He would break up with me. And I know I don't feel comfortable doing this. And I know it's not right, but he would leave. Well, what if I 
It's just computer. It's just porn. I'm not hurting anybody else. I don't need to extend that person forgiveness. They hurt me. They wronged me. They they used me. They abused me. It's my right to stand my ground, and I don't need to forgive or release any of that. We go back to the sin of despising our our parents, our grumbling. We're we're of a grumbling spirit. We're selfish. Our our vain ambition, our conceit, we'll do anything to get ahead, even if it means squashing others around us. We gossip like you wouldn't believe. The words that come from your mouth about the classmate sitting next to you. Words of death. And we return to these things because they're just what we've always known. But then we come into the presence of God to worship, to praise him, to hear from him, to pray, to seek healing, and we feel a block. I feel like, I don't know, unless like I have the whole shebang and it riles my emotions up, I don't really feel God. I don't know, I, I feel like I'm just not hearing from God and yet this is sitting on our bedside table collecting dust and it's full of his words. We hear these and experience these blocks and this is what the enemy wants Because he wants you confused about your identity, not realizing you're a son or a daughter. He wants you overwhelmingly anxious. Raise your hand if you feel like you deal with anxiety that can be crippling. Now let's be honest and raise our hand if we feel like we deal with anxiety. Yeah. Praise God for y'all's humility and your honesty. He wants you scared. What's the future going to hold? What's it going to look like? How's it going to go? Any of y'all deal with fear? He wants you waking up after dreams that are terrifying, feeling completely drained. He wants you angry. Anybody experience outbursts of rage and anger? Yeah. Someone was like, Kevin, raise your hand. It's the fifth fight this month, dude. Yeah. I don't know who Kevin is, sorry. You're probably a peaceful guy. Okay, bring it back. Modern psychology, all of these mental health focuses, many will say, it's okay. Just allow this. It's it's good every now and then to allow these things to burst out of you. Yet the word of God says that we are to be self-controlled. Any of you confused about your identity, haven't heard from your parents who you were truly made to be, seeking worth in places, maybe that's with guys, with girls, maybe that's coming home and just turning off your brain to the world, consuming things. It's just an obsession, your phones or sports or whatever it may be, TikTok. We just numb our minds, deaden our minds, get home and just consume because we don't actually know what our purpose is. Anyone deal with struggles with their identity? One person. I love your humility for that. Girl, I did. It's actually probably about two to three hundred people that are a little too afraid to raise their hand. The reality is that these issues that we are struggling with, the enemy is thrilled that the people of God think we're supposed to just go through life coping. When Christ says, no, I came to set the captives free. You're not meant to walk through life on a balance being trying to cope. He came to set you free. But how did freedom come for us in Christ? Someone help me the answer. It's one word, two words. How did freedom come for us through Christ? The cross, thank you. I was like, yes, I did it, Julie. Did you hear me? I said the cross. The cross was the ultimate act of forgiveness. Because forgiveness has the power to break the chain off of every stronghold, everything oppressing you, everything that has weighed you down. It has the right to be there, the right to stay when we have not extended forgiveness. Now, I'm not talking about forgiveness and reconciliation just now because that's dynamic. And there are some of you who have been hurt in this room that you think forgiveness implies you have to go be back with the person who really hurt you. 
But this is the truth of forgiveness. Forgiveness is in our minds, our hearts, our place of prayer, our place of humility, saying, God, I release any ill will I have towards the person who's hurt me. I release forgiveness to my dad. I'm just going to start to prophesy. I'm going to say things that are coming to my spirit, and it might be specific for you. If it is, please receive it in humility. I release forgiveness to my dad, who I wake up in the morning, and he's gone, and I come back at night, and he gets home and goes to bed, and I don't see him. I don't hear from him. He doles out the money, and he gives me the opportunities, but I haven't even heard from my father that he loves me. I haven't heard from my father that he believes I am an image-bearing creation of God. I haven't heard vision or mission from him about my life. I extend forgiveness to my mother. I'm receiving alcohol. Some of your moms may be dealing with alcoholism. There's tension in the home. There's yelling. I release forgiveness to my mother who these things have gripped her and it's affected us. I feel like I have to be a parent to my younger sibling and I'm resentful about that. I'm anxious about that. I feel like I have to take care of our home. Some of you need to extend forgiveness to the people who have lied to you, to the friendship relationships and dynamics where there's been backstabbing, where there's been manipulation, where there's been gossip and where there has been lying. Some of you need to release forgiveness forgiveness, to say, I can separate that person from the sin that was operating through them, and I can forgive that person. Some of you need to extend forgiveness when you look in the mirror and you despise what you see, and you allow every voice to tell you that your body is horrible, that it is not enough, that you're not strong enough, that you're not fit enough, that you're never going to be enough and you look and you despise the very temple of the Holy Spirit that God has given you. Some of you guys need to ask for God's forgiveness for despising his creation in you. Some of you all need to extend forgiveness for the divorce that occurred in your home, for adultery that occurred in your parents' marriage that you all received the repercussions of. Some of you all need to extend forgiveness to the person who sexually hurt you. I again am not saying saying physical reconciliation is always the next step, but you can begin by releasing forgiveness. Some of you all need to extend forgiveness to people who have spoken words over you, that you were an accident, that you were a mistake, that you are a burden. Many of y'all are hearing that you're a burden. And if it's not spoken, it's like passive aggressively unspoken over you that you're a burden and that you're a drain. Some of you all need to seek forgiveness from God for the ways that you have let fear and shame hold you back from walking boldly in who he made you to be. Forgiveness is the key. It has always been the key. It always will be the key. And that's why it's the absolute hardest thing. Because forgiveness has the power to break the chains and break the yokes of inequity. I remember when I was recovering from my dad's suicide, I was so angry, so resentful. I um, had the car accident and I came to know Jesus and the first thing he started handling in me was my sexual sin, my lust, my addictions. The next thing he started handling in me was my anger and my resentment. And I said, I prayed, God, okay, then, then make it so that I can forgive. I want to forgive him. I know I need to just forgive him. So make me able to forgive. And instead of waking up and magically saying, I'm capable, <laughs> when I was really hurt, instead he actually planted a seed of compassion in my heart. And I began to see the person of my dad as a young child, growing up just an Alabama boy. As a young student, as he moved through middle school and high school, his dad was moving constantly, his parents, for work. And so he w was on the football teams. And just as he found his, his friend group, they'd have to move again. And just as he felt like he fit, they'd have to move again. And this transient lifestyle f left him feeling like he didn't fit anywhere. 
And then I saw him as a young college guy and I wondered what made him pursue law. And then I saw him meeting my mom who was literally like a beauty queen. And I mean, when I talk about being on different leagues, it's startling, but he, he snagged that. And so I remember him meeting my mom and I'm seeing these things and catching me and my sister as we were born. And then I'm seeing as he's dealing with the weight of expectations of provision and protection as he's feeling inadequate, as he's overwhelmed with addiction, as he's struggling in so many ways. And then I saw him on the bed putting a gun to his heart and ending everything. And suddenly, because God had humanized my dad for me, my heart broke with compassion to a man who was afflicted and who was hurting. And when I felt compassion, I was able to extend forgiveness. And I was freed from a spirit of suicide that overwhelmed me. God wants to set you free. If you're 12, if you're 18, don't wait till you're 32 to begin handling these things. Awaken and arise. The Spirit of God is for you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. He modeled the way to walk in power and that picture was forgiveness. So I want to pray over you guys. I know you've got to get to class, but I want you to open yourself today and say, Holy Spirit, is there anyone I'm withholding forgiveness from? Is there something I'm so mad about that I can't release, that I need to release? Is there a way I've been hurt where I need to seek forgiveness? Is there ways I've sinned that I need to ask for your forgiveness? I want to be free. The Spirit of God wants you all bold in your faith. The boldness on Peter's life changed when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit leads us in the way that we should go and gives us all the things we lack. Courage, peace, hope, joy. So Heavenly Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would come and move in power to baptize any who are hungry in your Holy Spirit. That you would move over them and encounter them. That you would speak to them and stir within them the areas of pain or of wounds or of unforgiveness. God, I pray that these students would be brought to a place of humility. I pray they would hunger and thirst for righteousness now. I can only imagine the destiny on their life fulfilled when they humble themselves before you now. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move over this entire school, this student body, would break chains of identity issues, would break chains of anxiety, would break chains of fear, would break chains of anger, and that we would see a move of boldness over this body, that they would come into the fire power of the Spirit of God in them, that they would know what it means to walk in joy and in freedom, that they would be unified and of one accord, that the older would lead the young, that the younger would set examples for the older, that guys and girls would walk in healthy, God-honoring relationships, that you would restore what moth and rust has destroyed, what the locusts have eaten in their lives, that you would bring healing and wholeness by your power in Jesus' name. We love you and we trust you. We declare these things done in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys.